want to do something like a short video, want to do a short video or audio, depending on what you have the capacity to do, summarizing that audio. The audio is very powerful. Maybe you've missed it because of the number of text messages and things you've been putting out on the WhatsApp group. I'm going to put it out again. It is compulsory. It is compulsory that you make sure you download that audio and do a summary of that audio. Maybe in a YouTube format or maybe on as a voice note or WhatsApp or when we have a Zoom class like this, you can join us. Okay, so Christabel, all the way from Lagos, has a presentation to do. I'm going to unmute you at some point in, in a short while, and then we will begin today. All right. So, so, yeah. Precious, precious too. Yeah. The presentation. I see your get up yeah. now. I want everyone to be involved in this in this assessment. I'm going to be getting your comments about their presentation. A few things we will analyze. The first thing I want you to take down, bring out your viral and write, because you want to learn how to assess people, including assessing yourself. Okay, so a few things you want to pay attention to. The first thing you want to write down is appearance. How is a person appearing? Appearance, you want to look at appearance. You're going to scale, you want to score them on a scale of one to 10. One means very poor. The appearance, the dressing wasn't very good, or they didn't dress for the occasion. They didn't dress to impress. You look at the appearance, five being average, 10 being excellent. So you can work on that range, uh, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. The next thing you want to assess them is their body language, especially their facial gestures, how they use their face to pass across their points. Did they speak with their face? Did they speak with their hands? How, how are they expressive? So the body language, of course, they're not standing. They're, they're only, we're only seeing their faces. So you're going to score them between one and 10. The next thing you're going to assess them is their vocal variety. What do I mean by vocal, vocal variety? Basically, we're looking at their tonality, we're looking at their inflection, we're looking at their expression, we're looking at their prose, so they're looking at how they use their voice. When they are expressing sadness, can we sense, feel, and believe that they are sad? When they're expressing excitement or nostalgia or enthusiasm, can we sense, feel, and believe they are showing that expression through their voice? How strong is their voice? How are they able to manipulate their voice? So you want to score them between one and 10. The next thing you're also going to pay attention to is to transition. Now, I've not taught you um, speech preparation methodology on Zoom. I'm going to make sure I teach you so you understand the power and the importance of transition. If you're a speaker like I am, and you're a professional speaker, you need to understand how to move from one point to another seamlessly. Move from one point to another seamlessly, either using the prep formula or using the windshield wiper method. I'm going to explain that when that time comes. For those of you who have been following me, who have been in WhatsApp and been reading, you probably have you're acquainted with that term, prep formula, windshield wiper method. So transition basically means how are they able to move from point to point? How are they able to marshal out their points seamlessly so that you can understand what are their take homes? All right, the next thing also, we're going to pay attention, score them on a scale of one to 10. The next thing we're also going to look at is their elocution. When we talk about elocution, basically, I'm looking at not just their eloquence, I'm looking at their delivery. Like I've often said that when it comes to communication, when it comes to really to communication, we focus on delivery and not just on the content. They may have smart content, great content, but their delivery is very poor. So elocution, how do they deliver the subject matter? It leads us to the next thing that you want to assess people, and we call it audience appeal. What do we mean by audience appeal? Audience appeal simply means, were they able to connect with you? On a scale of one to 10, were they able to connect with you? How are they able to connect with you? And we've said, and I'm going to teach that as a class and as a course, I thought I thought about I thought it I thought it um, last week when we discussed about how to interest any audience. We said that audience appeal is when is audience analysis leading to audience engagement. When you audience analysis plus audience engagement equals audience appeal. So you need to know what kind of audience are you dealing with. You're dealing with fellow public speaking students from all over the world, all over Africa particularly. And then how are you able to engage us? Did you engage us with questions? Did you engage us with a story? Did they engage us with humor? Did they engage us with icebreakers? So we're going to score you based on 
between one and 10. The next thing we're also going to pay attention to is your diction and grammar. Now, this is very important. Uh, one of these days, we're going to have a certain resource person teach us in this class how to speak better English, because that's our language for those of you who are in Nigeria. And if you want to do any business globally, English language is the language you want to learn how to use. You want to learn how to use it you know, in a good way. So score them on a scale of one to 10, how you think they fare when it comes to diction and grammar. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that's seven things. Of course, very important how they open their pre presentation, their opening, that's the eighth thing. The opening simply means their primacy, how they start. You score them on a scale of one to 10. Of course, I've showed you how to open presentation, that there are many ways through a quote. If you don't know what to do, use a quote. Um, through a story, analogy, icebreaker, statistic, all of that can help you to open presentations. And closing is also very important that at the recency, how do they close their presentation? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There is one more I'm not, uh, not talked about. Have I mentioned diction and grammar? Look up for okay. Have I mentioned appearance? Uh, uh, and I think, have I mentioned body language? Uh, vocal variety? Okay, so when I think about it, I'll let you know about it. Diction and grammar. Okay, yeah, very important. The last one is the content. Of course, you have to score the content. What's the quality of the, what's the logic? Was it, is, it, is it logical? Do they marshal their point? Do they have resource? Is it valid? Is it profound? And all of that. So those are the 10 things. Appearance, body language, book of variety, transition, education, audience appeal, diction and grammar, opening, closing, and content. That's how you score people. And we total it, and then we'll get different. Usually, we're supposed to have two judges who will judge each of them. And at the end of the day, we score them. The average of their score is the actual score. So I'm going to score Precious, and I'm also going to score um, Christabel, Precious and Christabel today. And I want you to also do the same thing. We'll get our thoughts and opinions at the end of this. Are we good to go? All right, so if you're good to go, where you need to pay attention, I want you to pay attention very carefully, take down as much note as possible because it will help you. I'm gonna take you right now to the slides in my Google Drive and I'm hoping that you would have a rewarding time. So public speaking is an imperative. You've not, you don't just want to know it, you want to master it. You want to master it so well that people would want to listen to you. I'm gonna do a check on how powerful communication is and how we can become a commanding communicator or how we can become commanding communicators. I want you to pay attention carefully because if you do not understand what we are sharing today, you will lose out in life. And if you understand what we are sharing today, you will become immortal. You will become great. You become a person that people will want to recognize. And um, you become somebody people want to recognize. So I'm taking right now to my slides, and today we'll be looking at public speaking. Yes, the pros and the cons, or rather we should say the dynamics, the dynamics, the mechanics and the dynamics of communication, how you can be a commanding communicator. My name is George Asian, and I'm a life coach and motivational speaker. I'm also a serial entrepreneur. If you want to reach out to me, if you want to get across to me, my WhatsApp number is right there on the screen, 0818713153. The original is from outside of the country, then you need to add plus 234. I'm the CEO of Learn and End Ventures. I'm also the president of PowerMinds Community and the co-founder of a foundation called Blue Sky Development Foundation. So I have a lot of my hands. My Twitter handle is PPC. My website is judgeacn.com. You can check me out on Facebook, George Isia, and on Google+. And that's the pictorial representation of what you can see. I am doing this full-time. I travel around Nigeria and across Africa, speaking, training, and helping people to become better in what they do. Public speaking is my thing. And that will tell you why I believe public speaking is something we should pay attention to. I'd like to begin with the words of Daniel Webster. Daniel Webster was one who put together the dictionary. Those early uh, persons who put together the dictionary that we make reference to. And um, he once said something very striking. If you have a viral or pen rather, I'd like you to write the words that he said. Daniel Webster once said, if all the talents and powers I have were to be taken from me by some 
inscrutable providence and I had my choice of keeping one, I would ask to be allowed to keep the power of speaking for through it, I would quickly recover the rest. I'd like to repeat it for emphasis. If all the talents and powers I have were to be taken from me by some inscrutable providence and I had my choice of keeping one, I would ask to be allowed to keep the power of speaking for through it, I would quickly recover the rest. Now I want you to underline a few words, inscrutable, that word may seem strange, but I want you to underline it, inscrutable. The next word I'd like you to underline is providence. What do those two words mean? I checked the dictionary and I realized the word inscrutable is closely related with the word mysterious. And the word providence is closely related to what deity. Now, if we insert mysterious and deity into that quote, perhaps we get to understand it better. I repeat it again with those words I just uh, mentioned. If all my talents and powers I have, if all the talent, talents and powers I have were to be taken from me by some mysterious deity, and I had the choice of keeping one, I would ask to be allowed to keep the power of speaking, for through it, I will quickly recover the rest, striking. So you're standing before deity, you're standing before God, and it says, I want to get everything from you. I want to get your talent, but you have the choice to pick only one. And then he's saying, Daniel Lopsa is saying, give me the power of speaking. For if I have the ability to communicate, if I have the ability to speak, I will quickly recover every other talent or ability that you have taken from me. I'll quickly recover leadership. So there's no effective leadership without speaking. I'll become very entrepreneurial. I can't sell without speaking. I can't lead without speaking. I can't become all I want to be without speaking. Communication is the essence of life. Something happened a few years ago. I want to look at the picture of this beautiful lady right there on the slide. Now, I don't know if you saw the picture. In 2014, something went viral. Uh, this, this guy standing by the side there, this man wearing a black top, was doing a photo shoot. T.Y. Bello was doing a photo shoot of this rap artist. And in the course of the session, a certain lady who sells agege bread, you know, actually wearing a red dress, she was walking in, she just actually bumped into that photo shoot. I mean, she was not putting her hands to hold the bread. The bread laid on her head very perfectly and she walked very smoothly on, I mean, as the shot was taken. It was not deliberate. She literally bumped into that photo shoot. Now in the course of checking the pictures, the T.Y. Bello noticed that her picture was fantastic. Her name was Ola Jumoke. And, and she, I mean, she actually did not know who she was and began going on social media, going on Instagram and on Facebook. I need to find this lady. I need to know who she is. She will make for a good model. Now they discovered her, that she was a bread seller. She sold a gigi bread. Her husband was in a shoe state with her son. She had come to Lagos to sell and to make money. And all she could do was a gigi bread. I mean, got her, she couldn't speak. She couldn't speak, she couldn't communicate. I mean, she became a sensation overnight. I'm sure you remember that story. She was all over the places. The blogs took her story. She was great. And people wanted to keep hearing her story. The, the blog wanted to hear her stories. Vlogs wanted to hear her stories. Television stations wanted to hear her stories. But she couldn't communicate. Now, the best thing that the people who found that could do for her was take her to a finishing school that has public speaking as part of their curriculum. And she learned how to speak. And I'm sure she's doing better today. That is her picture. She turned out to be a sensational person. Now, if you look at this work of art, this work of art is done by a certain guy called Oreshia Gun Olumide. He's from, he's a Yoruba guy, and he's a very creative person. A Yabatek artist who could paint pictures, who could tell stories with oil paints. An amazing guy. But there was a challenge. They got across to him, became a social media sensation, went viral. They wanted to meet this, this guy. And when they met him, told him to tell them their st his story, he couldn't communicate. You see, the truth of the matter is that communication is important. May life not bring opportunity your way, and because you cannot communicate, you lose out on that opportunity. This is so very important. You know, in the lower rung of life, in the lower cadre of life, emphasis is on your technical expertise, on how technically good you are, even if you're a medical doctor or you are whatever. Technical expertise is, is given premium preference. But as you want to rise higher, the ladder of the corporate circle, ladder of any organization, emphasis is more not on the technical abilities, technical abilities, but on your managerial abilities and on your ability to communicate. Communication is so important. 
And so I want to emphasize here strongly that we take our time to develop ourselves, to start watching videos, to start learning, not to miss classes, to take down notes, to increase our capacity, because communication is very important. It's vital to your success in life in the organization. So let's go back into history. 2,500 years ago, how did this whole thing about public speaking start? I mean, it started because of some kind of preference that um, society and the world had for the nobles and the royals. If you were, if you wanted to be, if you were going to be educated, you had to be a prince, you had to be a member of the courtyard, you had to be um, a princess before you could be educated. And the, the, the system, the law back in the years in ancient times was that actually in Greek, ancient Greece, was that you have to defend yourself. Let's say you have a property and somebody is trying to override or take that property. You go to in front of a panel and then you stand there and defend yourself. You defend yourself. There was no lawyer back then. You had to defend yourself. Now, the people who had the opportunity to effectively defend themselves because of their training were those who are nobles and princes and princesses. But the peasant people, the poor people, the average people, they don't have access to that kind of education. So these guys called the sophists, S-O-P-H-I-S-T. Sophists is from the word Sophia, it's Greek, and it means wisdom. These men were wise people. They began to look out for the poor masses because a lot of poor people had lost their inheritance, gone into exile because they could not defend themselves, because they could not make their arguments better. And so you want to go and research on the Sophies, a very interesting lot of people. They will gather information, put the average people under the tree, and begin to teach them how to make their arguments better in front of a panel. That's literally how public speaking started. I mean, teaching people how to speak better. And they did it for a while. After a while, they started to charge a fee. That's how schooling for the average people started. They said to start charge a little fee to, uh, to those peasant people, pay a token so that you can place value on this thing you are learning. And so they make the arguments better. Now, the Sophies became evolved to what we call to get it to today philosophers. The word philosophers is a combination of two words, philio and sophie. Philio and sophie. Philio means um, law, means a kind of law. You know, camaraderie means uh, brotherly love, and then Sophie means wisdom. So these people later were called lovers of wisdom. Now, in honor of the Sophies, every academic, every school down the years has something to do on a very regular basis. I'm sure you're aware of it. These guys in school, uh, when you want to graduate from school, you do what is called a defense. You defend your project. You stand before a panel and before some students and defend yourself. What truly shows that you went through that program is your defense of the degree that you have. It's in honor of the Sophies. Now, I mean, the world is littered with people who were communicators and communication had been given preference. There was an era in the world where emphasis was made on military might and strength. But again, as the ancient Greeks took over the world, I mean, focus was on intel intellectualism, your intellectuals and your ability to communicate. We think of people like Oros Aristotle, amazing guy. Aristotle was not just a communicator, he was a teacher of other communicators. He taught the man called Alexandra the Great. Now write down these names, Aristotle, rather than Alexander the Great. Now he taught, he implanted the seed of greatness through words to Alexander the Great. Now Alexander the Great was a son of the king of Macedonia. The king of Macedonia was by the name King Philip. King Philip had one eye. He was a son. And you know, the king of Macedonia, King Philip, the one-eyed king, was satisfied with this terrain. But he got this man, the philosopher called Aristotle, to come teach his son, Alexandra. And the teaching of his son, the son taught him a lot of things. Culture, medicine, public speaking, motivation, co you know, communication. He made Alexander not just dream of being a local king to becoming a global king. And through words, Alexander the Great inspired his men to charge through armies, fight many battles, and literally conquer the world. I'm sure if you did history, you probably have heard of the likes of Alexander the Great. People, history is littered with communicators that truth. And I wanted to also look at these two orators of antiquity. Write that down in your notes. Orators of antiquity. The 
The first orator I want you to write is Demosthenes. D-E-M-L-D-E-M-O-S-T-H-E-N-E-S. -E 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 now, when I give you a technical name, when I give you a name of a person, I'd like you to write the name and then go research, go find out about him. That adds to your knowledge and that makes you a very content rich speaker. Who was Demosthenes? Can you say Demosthenes? Again? I think again? I didn't get. Demosthenes. D-E-M-O-S-T-H-E-N-E-S. Demosthenes, right there on the screen, right there on the screen. Cicero okay. and Demosthenes. Mm. Demosthenes was from a wealthy home in ancient Greece, but he suffered from a speech impediment. He couldn't speak fluently. And because he suffered from that speech impediment, he lost his inheritance. He's, um, I mean, some people came, the, the, the society, they came, attacked him, and they took his inheritance from him. And he was so angry. He went to the seashore, the beach side, you know, and then he began to practice how to speak. He would put pebbles and stones in his mouth and he would practice speaking deliberately. He would practice oratory. He did it so long and so well that he became one of the greatest speakers in ancient Greece. Greatest speakers in ancient Greece. Also, Marcus uh, Cicero was in ancient Rome. And after the ancient Greece ruled the world, ancient, the Greeks ruled the world, the Romans ruled the world. In ancient Rome, Cicero will speak so well and people will clap and say, oh, what is speak? It shows that in ancient time, emphasis was given on your ability to communicate. In fact, there's a part in the Bible that talks about a certain herald that spoke so well and people said to him, said of him, that you will speak like a god. And the scriptures talks about an angel striking him. So oratory was given preeminence in ancient times. Now, of these two people, and I want you to pay attention carefully, of these two people, it is said that if Marcus Cicero gave a presentation or gave a speech, people will stand up and clap and say, oh, what a great speech. That's for Cicero. But it is said that if Demosthenes gave a presentation, whatever the presentation was, or whatever the speech was, people will say, let us pick up weapons and go to war. He knew how to speak to men and get them so motivated enough to pick up weapons and go to war. And these two orators of antiquity epitomize two different kinds of communication. The first kind of communication is called presentation. When we think of Cicero, we think of presentation. What a great speech. But when we think of Demosthenes, we don't just think of presentation, we think of persuasion. Let us pick up war, weapons and go to war. So Cicero epitomizes all the presentation is, and Demosthenes epitomizes all the persuasion is. Which would you rather prefer? Would you want to just be a presenter or would you want to be a persuader? You are truly an amazing communicator when you can transition from just doing presentation to doing persuasion. Now, people may admire a presenter, but they will pay and they will follow a persuader. That's what you should do. These two orbitals of antiquities bring to light these two kinds of communication, presentation and persuasion. Reminds me of the Second World War. Now, the Second World War was a massive one. If you're a student of history, you've heard that the world has seen Three, uh, two world wars. The first world war was between 1917 and 19, uh, I think 1920 or so, quite a while. And the second world war began between 1939 and ended in 1945. What made the world war happen? It was, it was called the orator, the, the, you know, orators were the men who fought the world war. And this man by the name Adolf Hitler, write down the name Adolf Hitler and go and do your research. He was not just a military man, he was not just the, just the chancellor of Germany, he was the chancellor of Germany, he was also an amazing orator. He was able to convince Germans back then that they were of a superior race. And he was able to convince them that the Jews, you know, the Jews, Israelis, who didn't have a particular location at that time, were responsible for the econ economic doldrum of the German society, that they had to be annihilated. And so a genocide began. He began to put, he stirred up men, look at him there, 
he stirred up people with, with, his, with his personality and his ability to communicate. And they began, fellow Germans began to kill Jews. Over 6 million Jews were killed as a result of the whole, what we call what is now called the Holocaust. Even to today, Germany is still paying a token to Israelites because of this the dastardly act of this man, this evil genius, an orator called Adolf Hitler. Because of that, the whole world went into war. The man wanted to become like Napoleon Bonaparte of um, the legendary emperor of France. He wanted to annex and take all over Europe. He actually got over England. I'm sure you've heard the story, London Bridge is falling down. It is as a result of the bombs, the German bombs that landed in the London Bridge and he annexed Poland, Austria, and many other countries. Now, what, look, at, look at the dead people, dead Jews killed in their numbers because a, what did he say? What did he say to his fellow Germans that would get them to rise up? And not just, he didn't just do a presentation, he was a persuader. Get them to rise up and go and kill fellow human beings. He put them in gas chambers like this gas chamber here. He put them in gas chambers and literally suffocates, uh, suffocates a lot of them. Amazing guy. What, how was he defeated? He took an equally eloquent and persuasive man, orator called Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill happened to be the prime minister of ancient, uh, of, um, of Britain at the time. He was able to inspire the allied forces. So we cannot allow this. Let's go fight, let's fight, let's fight. And inspire them and that's how Adolf Hitler was killed. And that, that marked the end of the world war, the second world war. So communication is seen everywhere. In war, there is communication. I mean, look at the picture of this man by the name Jim Jones. The man called Jim James and his horror. And because he, used, he learned how to master words and not just sound like a presenter, like a dull presenter. He moved from dull to dynamic. He moved from presentation to persuasion. And that's the goal of this entire process teaching you not just to do presentation, but to do persuasion. And you see, Jim Jones was a pastor. He told his members to drink cyanide. And that if they drank cyanide, they would go to his heaven, to a heaven. And they did. Look at the pictures of them. Over 700 people drank cyanide at one time and you know, holy, holy, what they call the Holy Communion, and they all died there. Amazing what the power of words. I mean, go and go and research, just do your Google search on Jim Jones and find out what did he say to them? What did he say to them that will make people literally, you know, follow his instructions? Yes, the point I'm trying to make. I've told you about two evil people already and how negatively persuasive they were. Adolf Hitler and now Jim Jones. History is littered with orators who ruled. The man who can speak is a man who will rule. The man who can speak is a man who will rule. I mean, and you need to learn speakers and leaders. And that leads us to a positive guy by the name Martin Luther King Jr. Of course, you've heard about his I Have a Dream speech given at the Abraham Lincoln Memorial. You know, this black man did so much for America judge the conscience of America through his speeches and he used words to galvanize people. And that brought the freedom of literal freedom of the American people. Now, how can you, how can you as a speaker move from dull to dynamic? How can you as a speaker move from, you know, lackluster to enthusiasm? What are the things, what are those things that Jim Jones knew? What are those things that Adolf Hitler knew? What are those things that Alexander the Great knew? What are those things that these great men knew that made them very powerful? Now, this is where you start taking down a lot of notes. We've got to understand what truly communication is. You understand, when you understand what communication is, you're good to go. What is communication? Communication is simply three things. First of all, communication is connecting plus casting, plus convincing. Remember this sequence. Remember the sequence. Connecting, casting, and convincing. A lot of people, when they want to communicate, the first thing they want to do is they try to convince. It doesn't work like that. You're speaking in front of some investors, you're trying to convince them. Trying to speak in front of some customers, you're trying to convince them. 
to your audience, you try to convince them. You don't try to convince the audience. You don't begin by trying to convince the audience. Dynamic communicators connect first. You have to find a way to connect. Then transition to casting your vision or casting your, your pitch, your speech, before you now go ahead to convince. If you understand this, you'll be able to get a lot of things going for you. So what does it mean to connect? First thing, you have to develop rapport. Rapport, it means to connect means to find rapport. How can you get rapport with the speakers? And I often tell people, I said, um, to my trained, my students, I said, stop speaking to the audience, start speaking with the audience. It's a different philosophy. You can speak to an audience, and that's fantastic, that's presentation. But when you speak with the audience, you're trying to engage the audience because the audience is very important in the communication process. So you listen before you speak. Listen to the pause, listen to, listen, listen to learn, and learn to listen. You mirror, you mirror means that if you're speaking to an audience that is uh, conservative, then you mirror conservatism, or uh, you become conservative in your dressing. You identify, you find common ground, you respect, you relate, you explain. That's the first thing you should be thinking of doing when you're speaking in class. How do you connect with the audience? What would you say to connect with the audience? What would you say? What story would you, would, you, would you tell? What question would you ask? How would you find a person's ego? What common ground do you need to pull the room? What icebreakers would you do? You've got to connect first. All dynamic speakers began, begin, be, began way back and begin from now those who are amazing today by connecting first. The next thing you want to learn to do, which that's the next thing, is casting. What does it mean to cast? Casting, a few metaphors I'll explain. To cast means to throw seeds, and words are seeds. Be deliberate about your phraseology. Be deliberate about the words we use. We're so excited about how Precious began using words. And one of the things I'm going to be teaching you to do in the coming days is how to use idioms and metaphors and analogies. Be deliberate about words because words are seeds. They're implanted in the hearts of men. And you don't just want to cast. You want to cast words severally. Don't be afraid to repeat. Repetition is a principle for a lasting impression. That's what casting is. Keep sowing the seeds and people will, they will eventually grow. Learn how to use words. When we talk about casting, we're also talking about formation. Understand that as you speak words to people, you are forming them. Understand that as you speak words to people, you are forming them. You're casting mindsets. You are casting philosophies into the minds of people, into the minds of your children, into the minds of the audience. So be deliberate. There has to be an intentionality, a deliberateness in your expressions, in your words. Your words have to be intentional. And that's why you have to have a robust vocabulary. Words have plenty of words to use, synonyms and anonyms, so that when, when you're expressing yourself, you're not speaking as someone who does not know, but someone who, who, who has that um, end game of forming and molding a mindset in people. And when we say casting, we're also talking about painting pictures. Write the word painting pictures. A good communicator knows how to paint pictures. You need to understand how to paint pictures. And the question at the back of your head is how do you paint pictures with words? You paint pictures with words by learning how to tell a good story. I taught you last week how to tell a story. I mean, I love the way Christabel did her story at the beginning of her presentation, how she met me, how, you know, she told, she did character, she did, um, she had dialogue and she had a punchline. It led to her first point. In fact, it led to her topic. It was a fantastic opening. It made her get nine over 10. Was it nine years? Nine over 10 in her opening. Casting means painting pictures through stories. You've got to know how to do that. And that leads us to the next thing, convincing. He now start convincing. So a good communicator starts with connecting with people, transitions to casting that uh, the thought you want to share through painting pictures, through throwing seeds, through repetition, before you go ahead to convince, before you go ahead to persuade. And persuasion is the art of getting what you want through communication. So let's begin to wrap up by talking about seven elements that facilitate effective communication. Every time there is effective communication, Every time, every single time, communication is effective. These seven elements were in place. They were always in place. And as a dynamic communicator, you must always be thinking at the back of your head, how do I get these seven elements to be in place? They have to be top notch. The first element that has to be in place is called the encoder. E-N-C-O-D-E-R. Who is the encoder? 
The encoder is who? Who? Put in brackets, W-H-O, who? The encoder is the sender of the message. In this context, I am the encoder and you are the decoder. So the encoder is who? Now the encoder is not just the sender of the message, the encoder is the owner. So you get to get a point where you own, you own your message, you think, you brood, you cogitate on the message and then you own the message. The encoder is the speaker, the leader, the teacher, the pastor. The encoder has to be in place. What are the things that have to be in place in the encoder's life that will make him very effective? Number one, write this down, it's not on the slide, credibility. Now I've taught you severally that credibility facilitates persuasion. Now when the encoder has credibility, persuasion is a lot easier. And so you must pay attention to credibility. Do you have credibility? The audience, they're evaluating and find out why should I be listening to this man? Or why should I be listening to this lady? All right, so that's the first thing, credibility. The next thing that the encoder must have is confidence. Confidence is what convinces people. The encoder must have credibility. The encoder must also have confidence. Does it make sense to you? Their credibility, the, the encoder must also have what is called charisma, swag. There must be charisma because if you have credibility and you have confidence and you don't have charisma, you still will not be effective as an encoder. Credibility, you know, um, uh, credibility, confidence, charisma, and then finally, the encoder must have content. All right, so we'll get into that. That leads us to the second element that, if, that effectively facilitates communication. The second thing is code. So the next thing we want to pay attention as dynamic communicators is find out how great is our code? What is our content? How great is our content? So the code is the message. The code is the lesson. The code is the morale. The code is the idea. The code is the philosophy. The code is the sermon. The code is the information. So put in bracket, in bracket code what? So we don't just talk about who, we're also talking about what. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Leads us to the third point. And the third point is the channel. C-H-A-N-N-E-L. The channel put in brackets, how? So the third element that facilitates effective communication is the channel. And what's the channel? The channel is the medium or platform of expression. The channel, channel is very, very important. And a lot of us don't know how powerful and how effective channels are. And in class, I usually use this analogy. I'll ask this question and I want to ask it to you. The teacher in the classroom and the radio presenter, who has a larger audience or who is more influential? A lot of times when I ask that question, students in class will say, oh, the presenter on radio has a larger audience and is more influential. Interesting. And I ask the next question, who has more content and more depth? And this is obviously a teacher in the classroom. So I, I now challenge that thing by saying, what if the teacher in the classroom also goes to the radio? What if the teacher in the classroom also goes to the television? What if the teacher in the classroom also use Zoom or use YouTube or use Facebook Live? The channel is important. The channel determines your reach. A lot of us have a great content. We have great code, but we're not as influential because of the weakness of our channel. And so I want to start thinking in terms of channels. I, one of the things we say in, in class is I'm a voice in my generation and I'm a force to reckon with. It is true that you're a voice in your generation, but if you don't have the right channel, you will be only a voice in your locality. You, if you're going to be a voice in generation, you have to think in terms of channels. I'll give you this, I'll give you this thought. When people watch you on television, what perception do they have of you? They feel that you have this larger than life personality. They have this good feeling about you because the television gives you that larger than life kind of personality. People have, because that's visual and that's audiovisual kind of communication. When they listen to you on radio, you have this call following because they listen to your radio than the teacher. So the channel is important and you've got to pay attention to it. It leads us to the, the, the next one, and that's the decoder. The decoder is, you put in bracket, whom? The decoder, you put whom? Now, decoder simply is the receiver of the message or the code. 
the, the receiver is the message of, of the, the receiver is the the decoder is the receiver of the message of the code. Now it's not. I want you to pay attention carefully. The decoder is not just the receiver; he is also the interpreter. The decoder is not just the receiver; he is also the interpreter. So when we say decoder. We're talking about the listener, the students, the audience, the congregation. Pay attention. The decoder is not just the receiver, it is the interpreter. In NLP and in communication, we say this. What makes you a great speaker is not your content. What even makes you a greater speaker is not your channel. What makes you a great speaker is not the, the confidence the speaker has, the charisma the speaker has. What makes you a great speaker is the interpretation of the decoder. It is the decoders that define good communication. It's the decoder that defines effective communication. If the audience does not get it, it doesn't matter how eloquent you are, it doesn't matter how swagalicious you are, if the audience does not connect, does not give the kind of feedback you're looking for, does not give the quality of feedback you're looking for, you are not a good communicator. Communication is defined by the audience, not by the communicator. Once you understand this, it helps you. Even as a teacher, as a teaching student, you realize that, look, your students define whether you're a good teacher or not. It doesn't matter how eloquent I think I am, if my students don't have good testimonies about what I'm doing to them, it shows that I'm not really a good communicator. So decoder, so we say that we say that reception is not the same as interpretation. And what truly makes a good communicator is when reception and interpretation aligns. And that is the challenge of speaking. Making sure that what you said is what they understand and how they give you the feedback. That is also the next point. Feedback. What's the feedback? Feedback is the goal of communication. The feedback is the interpretation, put in brackets, interpretation. The feedback is the response of the reaction of the audience or the decoder, either in words or in deeds. That is your goal. And so, as a dynamic communicator, you look out for feedback. You're observing their eyes. You're observing their body language. You're observing things because you're looking for feedback. You want to be sure that the feedback you're receiving is in alignment with what you're giving out. When feedback and code is in alignment, you are a good communicator. That is the challenge of communication, not your preparation. It is the delivery. How that you make what you said and what they reacted, how they reacted and what they responded uh, align. That is the challenge of communication. And the other two, the last two parts as is called situation and noise. Now, if I'm communicating in front of a set of people, uh, and for whatever reason, the place is hot, there'll be a challenge in communication. Or someone in that audience receives the news that gets to distracting, that gets to disorienting, that gets to disenfranchising, franchises him from that meeting, he will not be able to connect with me. So I'm looking at situations. I'm looking at, um, for example, let me give you this for a new for those of you who are speakers. If you go for an event, if you go for an event, and you are far away, I mean the, the, the podium is far away from the audience. Don't stay far away from the audience. Find a way to come down from that podium and walk into the crowd, get closer to the crowd, because there's something about proximity and communication. There's something about closeness to the audience and the energy that you emit. So don't stay far away. That's one thing, it's a tip for you. If you go for an event and you're speaking and you notice that um, the audiences, they are far apart from each other. I mean, one is sitting now in this corner, the other is in that corner. Don't start speaking until everybody comes and clusters together. Get them to fill the front seat, second seat, third seat before you start to do your presentation. Because there's something about closeness and shared emotions. So that if, if they're staying far apart and then you say something that is humorous, one person is laughing there, but the other person doesn't catch the humor and so doesn't get to laugh. And so there's a breaking flow. But if, if everybody is pushed together, is congregated together somewhat, you know, uh, and you share a humor, this person starts to laugh. The other person doesn't get to the joke, but he, he laughs because the other person is, is laughing. And so you're able to, you know, get mass emotions better. You can get results. So that is his situation. You get into the room and you notice that there's spacing, try and cluster people together, bring them closer together to, 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 to concentrate with you. 
And another thing is also noise. Okay? This noise basically talks about distraction. So those are the seven elements that must be in place, must be checked for you to become an effective communicator. And so we can give an all encompassing definition of communication in this light. Look at it now. I want us to pay attention that if you have a bio or a pen, write it down and don't ever forget it. As a matter of fact, for those of you who, are who will be doing examinations in a public speaking school, this is an exam question. We we'll ask you that question. We we'll expect, I expect you to write it out literally. Now, so, so what is this? This is simple. Communication is the process by which an encoder transfers a code to a decoder through a channel with the expectation of feedback without the interference of noise and situation. I repeat it one more time. Communication is the process by which an encoder transfers a code to a decoder through a channel with the expectation of feedback without the interference of noise and situation. If you notice this definition, it contains all of the seven elements, all of the seven elements that facilitates effective communication. The encoder, that is who, the code, that is what, the decoder, that's the receiver and the interpreter, the channel, that is how, the feedback, that is the interpretation from the decoder. And of course, we don't want the interference of noise and situation. So anyhow you define it, as long as all of these seven elements is inside the definition, you will be scored right. Communication is important. All right, so it leads us to the next thing that was saying that the goal of communication is feedback. Again, this interpretation, I already said that, that earlier. It's, it's interpretation. How am I getting the right kind of feedback? Now, I want to conclude my thoughts by helping you understand that when it comes to communication, we pay close attention to the decoders, the receivers, and the interpreters. And because of that, we have done this analysis. Realize that when we go to a speaking engagement, three kinds of decoders exist. The first kind of decoders that exist are called the V decoders. Who are the V decoders? The V decoders are visual decoders. In other words, when you speak in any meeting, in the meeting that they are in, they take those words and convert those words to pictures in your mind. They process things better and faster through pictures. They like to see things. They like to see those things you write on your flip chart, on the flip chart. They like to see those things you put on the slides. They like to see you demonstrate with speak up, speaking props. They like to see you do drama, analogies and illustrations on the stage. They like to see, that's how they learn and that's how they connect with the speaker. And we have a lot of them. Even when you're telling a story, they go into trance quickly. Their eyes go up and they begin to see what you're talking about. They're like, they don't want to hear, they want to see. That's how they experience and feel the speaker. Leads us to the second kind of, of um, audiences or decoders. They're called the F decoders. The F decoders, as the name implies, it F stands, it stands for feelings. They want to feel. They respond strongly to your tonality. They respond strongly to your passion, your enthusiasm, your, your cry, your pain you know, the sincerity of your voice, they are F decoders and they are very, they are very there. They're there in any audience. And then the last one is called C decoders. C decoders simply means content and conservative decoders, content driven and conservative decoders. What these guys do basically is that they are looking out for content. They are, and they're, not, they're not excited about the pictures and the videos and all that. They want you to, I mean, give us the content. They're logical, they're intellectual, intelligent. I mean, you can go to a meeting and you're speaking at that meeting and they're, they're not responding to you. They're almost emotionless, bland. And you're like, ah, maybe let me give one of those days I went to speak at an event. And I was, you know, I, I tried to reach out to them. I tried to do all of the, reach out to the visuals and feelings and conservative. I, I did, you know, they, they not responding to me. I'm like, what's going on here? What's going on here? Why am I able to connect with them? But I noticed that they were taking down a lot of notes. And so I switched, or they were willing to take down notes. So I had to switch my teaching strategy from just trying to impress them with passion or show them things to getting them to write stuff. 
and I gave them content. At the end of the meeting, they came and said, wow, that was a fantastic presentation. I like the thoughts that you share. You were very constructive. This argument was good, blah, blah, blah. I went to another meeting one of those days and I, and I didn't even say a few words. They were already freaking out. Whoa, whoa, speak up, bro. Mm, mm, mm. I'm like, uh -uh, what's going on here? That crowd, that lot are people who are feeling decoders, feeling decoders. And then you go for some meetings and then you notice that people are looking at you glazingly, looking at staring at you and looking at your slides, you know, paying attention to the stories and, and all the things that you say, you know, you just know these guys are visual decoders. And we have all three of them in a meeting, but one will be preeminent. One will, be, will gain ascendance over time. So the truth is that as you speak and as you learn to speak, you see how you can pay attention to all these three by one of the fastest ways to get to know which one is present in a meeting or which one is preeminent in a meeting is to tell a good story. When you learn how to tell stories, you will be able to sieve out. You sieve out the V from the F and the C. I'll tell you what. When you tell a story, there's a visual element of telling a story because you've got to be very descriptive in describing your character and in dialogue that you want to use. There's a visual element to telling a story, and people will start. You start looking at them. If they connect that way with you, you know, okay, these guys are Vs. If they're responsive that way, you can look at their eyes, and these guys are Vs. But when you go into the suspense part, the action part of tell, telling a story, and they are feeling you, and they are, you know, they are literally hypnotized. But storytelling is very hypnotic. Then you know these guys are the F decoders. But if you're doing all of that and they're not responding to you, they're not looking for the points, the point of all these things you're saying, they can sense that these guys are content or content driven or conservative decoders. So communication is so important. And I'm sure that you've gotten value from this class, by, and I, I'm sure that I'm able to help you understand that all of those great orators that we highlighted earlier were men and women who understood this, even though instinctively, these elements, the seven elements, the encoder, code, the channel, the decoder, the, the feedback, the situation, and the noise. And, and that also helps us understand that we have different kinds of communication. And all of them have different, all of these things can also play out in these different kinds of communication. We have verbal communication, which is what we're doing right now, which, uh, which we do when we speak in public. We have non-verbal communication. You need to understand that there's so much power in your non-verbals, your body language, your appearance. And that's why we score you based on that. Your body language, your appearance, your, your tonality, those are non-verbal cues and clues, and they're very strong. Your, there's something called intrapersonal communication. What of you have who suffer from state fright, or from glossophobia, you need to understand how to speak to yourself. Intrapersonal, intra, not inter. Intrapersonal communication speaks about how you speak to yourself, how you boost your morale. And of course, there are some guys who are good at one-on-one -on -one communication. When it comes to one-on-one -on -one communication, they are very good. But now tell them, oh yeah, go on stage and speak. They say, ah, no, 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 no. So, but it's a skill. Some guys are very good at one-on-one -on -one communication and don't know how to transition from one-on-one -on -one communication. You know, take that feeling, that that experience, or that expertise onto the stage or onto the podium. And we have what's called mass communication. Mass communication using the internet, radio. I mean, the first day I did live, I, I did live television for nine years. I did live television, what live television simply means that you're on live real time, on television real time live. And you can't afford to make mistakes. So in, in media, we have the recorded versions of stuff and we have live. Now when you do Facebook live, that is live, you can't afford to make a mistake because you're right there and now. And there's, there's something called the camera fright or the microphone fright that is associated with mass communication. And it's only when you keep doing a lot of Facebook live, YouTube live, Instagram live, that you overcome that fear. You overcome it. When you do it, most of you, um, is a fear. Most of you uh, did that. I'm sure I'm happy that uh, Christabel has overcome that fear. The first thing she did, the first time she did a presentation here, I could feel or sense it. But today, I didn't really sense it as much. So, we have what's called mass communication. We also have what's called marketing communication. There is a language that you need to adopt and it's a communication style and strategy when you're marketing. For those who are networkers, who are entrepreneurs, who are into sales, you need to understand how to market using communication. All right, there was something called corporate communication, how information flows in the organogram, in the hierarchy of any organization. And of course we have brand communication. Brand communication speaks about 
how organizations communicate with us through their colors, through their slogans, through their logos, and all of that. These are the different kinds of communication. You need to understand a few of them to become a dynamic communicator. I'd like to close with the words of Diana Schultz, of Harley Kanashos. Diana Schultz was a fellow who lived in a city called Harley Kanashos many years before Christ was born. And he said something striking about communication. He said, let thy speech be better than silence or be silent. All right, guys, are you still with me? Yes, sir, I'm still with you, sir. Okay, so we've had a wonderful time today.